Hello, hello. This is Taylor Shanklin with Kimbia, and I want to just thank everyone for tuning in with us today. I'm really excited to welcome Darian Rodriguez Heyman back to the webinar stage with us. Uh, he did a webinar with us last last year in 2016, and uh, people really enjoyed it. So today he's back talking about crowdfunding for your cause. And um, Darian, you want to go ahead and uh, introduce yourself? Oh, you've got um, my slide sure, first. Sure, do. <laughs> yeah, go for it. Okay. Sorry, this is uh, Taylor Shanklin with Cambia. For those of you tuning in with us who are familiar with us, um, we do online fundraising in all shapes and sizes from just everyday giving general donation forms to peer-to-peer -peer virtual and event campaigns and also to time-based giving day events. And um, for those of you who, who know us well, we, we love working with you and love having you back on our webinars. And thank you so much for, for joining us today. A couple of quick housekeeping items. We will be recording this as always, and I'll send out the link to the recording afterwards. And also we're gonna be doing a book giveaway. Darian is uh, an acclaimed nonprofit author, and we're going to be giving away five copies of his book, Nonprofit Fundraising 101, which has a chapter on crowdfunding. We're going to be giving away five copies to um, five lucky winners, random winners uh, who joined us and registered for the webinar. So with no further ado, now I will hand it over to you, Darian. All right. Thanks, Taylor. And thanks, everybody, for being part of today's program. Really excited to be with you today. And my name is Darian Rodriguez Heyman, as you heard. Uh, I've been working in the world of social impact for about 20 years now. And just really briefly, a little bit about my work. Um, you know, I got my career start uh, by serving as the executive director of Craigslist Foundation. And that was really where I discovered my life's work of helping people help. So what I do is I work with folks just like everyone on this call, nonprofit leaders, CEOs of mission-led businesses, and folks who want to change the world, and I help them realize their uh, their dreams of impact. Uh, and I do that uh, frequently by uh, connecting them to best practices and helpful resources and to one another. And that's a lot of what we're going to be doing today. Um, my work with the foundation led to my first best-selling book, uh, which is Nonprofit Management 101, kind of the first comprehensive guide to all aspects of running a successful nonprofit, super practical and comprehensive. Uh, when that came out, I launched the world's first conference series devoted to social media for social good, and that's called Social Media for Nonprofits, so I'll be taking some tips out of there. And then more recently, uh, you just heard about my new book, Nonprofit Fundraising 101, also a bestseller, also very comprehensive and practical, but really focused on all aspects of raising money for your cause. And so there are sections on online fundraising, which is where the crowdfunding and social media chapter will be found, sections on uh, corporate giving and foundation grants and individuals, uh, board and volunteer management, et cetera, and really looking at all the different disciplines within fundraising. Uh, I also am no longer just a uh, an educator. I'm also a practitioner, and I uh, am the part-time executive director for Newly Organic Tea's philanthropic arm, Newly Foundation where I'm putting a lot of these ideas into practice, helping to raise money for clean water projects in farming communities around the world. Uh, and then I also uh, run a couple of conference series, including one called Nonprofit Fundraising Masters. And our next conference is coming up on March 29th in Silicon Valley and September 19th in San Francisco. If you happen to be California-based, uh, you can come join me and watch me interview some of the world's most successful fundraisers and sharing their insights and inspirations with a, a live audience. So with that said, let's dive into today's topic and really this notion of crowdfunding and peer-to-peer -peer fundraising. Um, I wanted to start out very briefly just by speaking to why this is an important topic. And I'm really not gonna spend a lot of time here because clearly the fact that you're taking time out of your busy day to join us means you get that this is important. So I don't need to necessarily convince you of that. Where I really wanna focus our time today is on the tips and tools that are designed to help you be more successful. Uh, and the focal point of today's agenda will really be taking you through a 10-step process, kind of a, a how-to or an A to Z of uh, really the, the details of how to launch a crowdfunding campaign. 
Uh, and I also want to share some helpful resources if uh, you know you have any questions moving forward. I should add very quickly before we dive in that uh, I'm a pretty flexible speaker so that if anything that I say is not clear, if you have any questions about anything or if you're curious about how it replies to your organization, please feel free to use the chat functionality of the app uh, and just chat a question over to me privately and I can integrate answers to those throughout the webinar. There's no need to uh, you know, wait until the end to ask any burning questions. So with that said, let's dive into it. And in terms of why today's topic is important, fundraising with social media and looking at crowdfunding in particular, there's a variety of different reasons, but just a couple things to kind of plant a seed and, and start the conversation. One is that, um, you know, one of the things we professional fundraisers like to say is that people don't give to organizations, they give to people. And so social media and crowdfunding campaigns can allow your individual voices and areas of expertise to shine through. One of the other things that we like to say is that the most powerful form of ask is a peer ask. And that sounds something like, I just donated to Nuni Foundation's annual fundraising campaign. They're a great organization and you should support them too. Please join me in supporting their good work. Here's a link. Right, And that is what social media and what crowdfunding is all about, is leveraging the peer-to-peer -peer based nature of social media and of the internet. And so crowdfunding campaigns can be a great way for you to uh, expand your donor database in, and really ultimately convert your donors into fundraisers. Because one of the things that's so powerful about these social fundraising platforms like Kimbia is that once someone actually donates to your campaign on the thank you page, instead of just saying, thanks for donating, have a great day, simply by adding the functionality, and this is the case for almost all crowdfunding campaigns and a lot of the social fundraising platforms, but when someone donates on that thank you page, if you add the functionality, thanks for giving, click here to share on Facebook, or Twitter to invite your social network to follow your lead. And then when they do click, up pops a pre-populated message uh, that invites their network to follow their lead. And they can just send it as is or customize it. Simply by adding that basic functionality to your campaign, you're gonna raise twice as much money online. And almost as importantly, you're gonna raise it from people who wouldn't have given otherwise because you don't have a direct relationship to them. So now you're going two degrees out and essentially, like I said, converting um, you know, or turning your donors into fundraisers, into ambassadors for your cause. Uh, and this is a really powerful way to raise more money, but also to expand your, your you know, donor database. And so um, crowdfunding campaigns are a really powerful fundraising opportunity for all nonprofits of all sizes for these reasons. But again, uh, you know, you're already on the call, so you get why these are important. Um, and so rather than talk more about, you know, the, the rationale for why crowdfunding is a big deal, let's dive into the nuts and bolts. Let's dive into the nitty gritty of what you need to do to maximize the success and the performance of your online fundraising and crowdfunding campaign. So perhaps the most important tip, and the reason why I wanted to start out with this, is the importance of really making sure to take the time to be very concrete in your goals. Because if you launch a crowdfunding campaign or just online fundraising in general, um, and basically say, hey, donate money to us. The more money you donate, the more kids we can receive. Maybe you'll be able to raise some funds, but in, you know, if instead of taking that generic approach, you basically have that you know, United Way thermometer. And at the top of that thermometer, if you are able to achieve your goal, uh, there's some kind of impact that gets unlocked. So again, on one hand, you've got a campaign that says, donate as much as you can, the more you give, the more kids we can feed. On the other hand, you have a SMART goal. And that's an acronym. If you haven't heard it before, I really encourage you to look it up. It's a powerful concept, but it stands for a specific, measurable, attainable, realistic, and time-based goal. Uh, so the example here would be, we are raising $20,000 
We're doing it by the end of May. If we are able to achieve this goal, we are going to build a playground at San Francisco Elementary School and 647 children will benefit. And the research shows that schools with playgrounds have uh, higher attendance rates, higher graduation rates, higher GPAs, et cetera, better performance, right? So now what you've done is you've helped the potential donor really wrap their heads around exactly what kind of impact they are contributing toward and what kind of impact they're part of, right? And the other thing that we're doing here, by setting a deadline that occurs within the next 90 days, is that you are creating a sense of urgency. And ladies and gentlemen, I wanna make it really clear that we have entered what I would call the attention economy. And the currency in today's attention economy is likes, comments, shares, right? And so the idea is what you want to avoid at all costs, given that attention is so critical, is that somebody sees your campaign and they say, oh, oh the deadline's not for another nine months. Maybe I'll come back later uh, and donate that. No, that's death. That's like, you know, in someone's email when they put you in a separate folder of like, look at this later. The odds are really high they're never going to look at that later. That's why you want to be short, to the point, compelling, and time sensitive. Again, no more than 90 days out so that they take action immediately. And now they also really clearly understand not only what their contribution will unlock, and we'll talk about that in a little bit, but as part of an overall campaign that will achieve some kind of significant and demonstrable social impact. That's the playground, right? So, um, so this is really uh, step one is setting up that kind of smart goal. And the way that Case Brinkle Grace likes to say this, and I got to interview her for the major donor chapter of the book, is that people don't give to you because you have needs, they give to you because you meet needs. And so ultimately, it's not about the fact that, uh, you know, we need money in order to move forward. No, it's about with your support, we are going to be able to serve these children in this case. So remember that your organization is nothing more than a conduit for social impact. And all you do, in fact, all the nonprofit sector as a whole does, is connect people and organizations with resources to the change they want to see in the world. And so never forget that you are not asking for money for yourself or even for your organization. You're asking for those children, right? You're inviting people to support those kids. And we are just a conduit for impact. And so our job when we're launching a crowdfunding campaign is essentially to get out of our own way and to really shine the spotlight on what that ultimate impact uh, I should just quickly mention uh, that I want to thank Kimbia not only for hosting today's program, but for doing the book giveaway. So hopefully five of you are going to win a copy of the book and get a chance to read some of Case Brickle Grace's comments, as well as a lot of the stuff that uh, is in the online fundraising and crowdfunding and social media chapters. So really appreciative to them for their hospitality. So now let's take it one step further. As I mentioned, in addition to sort of the aggregate impact of this campaign, in this case, building a playground, what is the impact of not just the $20,000 overall that we're raising, but of my $50 contribution? And that brings us to our next tip, uh, which is the idea of thinking incrementally about your impact. And this is what I call the Sally Struthers effect of fundraising, because uh, those of you that are a little bit older, you'll remember those commercials when we were young, where Sally Struthers was saying, for the price of a cup of coffee, this kid can stay in school for a year. Or if you need a, a better modern day example, I encourage you to look at Heifer International. And uh, if you click on donate, what you'll see is give 50 bucks and a family will have a hive of bees and honey uh, and wax. Give $100 and they'll have, uh, you know, a cap and they'll get milk uh, and meat and leather, et cetera. And so it really helps the donor wrap his or her head around the kind of impact that they as an individual can make with their one gift. Really powerful in today's attention economy. 
And I should add the reason why I included Heifer International as my example here is that they really do a masterful job not only of thinking incrementally about how much impact can be unlocked for that uh, you know, individual gift, but they also have some great language there, almost like an asterisk, a disclaimer that says, hey, these examples are just illustrative. And actually, the money's going to general operating support. We're not going to buy another cow with your 500 bucks, um, you know, uh, but this is just to give you a sense of what kind of impact is possible. So I would literally cut and paste their language, um, you know, for your next crowdfunding campaign and maybe even for your online fundraising efforts in general. Really helpful. But usually the form that this kind of thinking will take is what's called a gift or a donation string. And you should have one of these on your website as well as on your crowdfunding campaign, right? And so the idea is you want to give people an example of different default donation levels. And we'll talk a little bit more about how to optimize this later. But the point is you want to be able to help people wrap their heads around what kind of impact can I make for 50 bucks? For 100 bucks, for 250, and for 500, right? And then, of course, you always want to give them the option to put in other because we love it when people write in a thousand dollar contribution. Uh, and surprisingly, those four and five figure online gifts are becoming increasingly common in the digital environment as people get more and more comfortable transacting in this way. As far back as 2013, the industry realized that this is not just kids that are donating to nonprofits through online vehicles. This is everyone. All generations have a favorable impression of crowdfunding and of online fundraising. And as far back as 2013, baby boomers and seniors were just as likely to give online as they were through direct mail. So this, you know, the tips I'm sharing here are not the future. They're happening now. And there is a huge fundraising opportunity afoot. So let's take the time to think about what kind of impact our campaign as a whole can unlock, and then also what kind of impact uh, is able to be incrementally made at some of the bigger and more important contribution levels that will make up your fundraising campaign. Now, uh, you know, I, I, as I mentioned, I want to thank. Uh, Kimbia for their hospitality for hosting today's program. I also want to thank them for being one of the kinds of platforms that makes this kind of campaign and all of the tips that I'm sharing today uh, feasible and actually pretty easy. So I'm not here to endorse any one particular platform, uh, but I do, what I do want to say is if you're not already a customer of Kimbia or one of the other platforms yet, I really encourage you uh, to shop around and to find a platform that works for you because having one of these platforms is absolutely critical. And if you think about it as opposed to something like PayPal where somebody clicks on the donate link and then they go to a completely different looking website, that would be the equivalent of you being a store owner. Someone comes into your store and picks out an item. They want to buy a sweater from you and you send them to a different store to go buy it not exactly that smooth, uh, and that sort of jarring uh, disjunction is likely to cause them to bail on the donation process. And even if they do transact, it feels more like they're buying something like a transaction uh, than it does a donation. And so we want to make sure to really meet donors where they're at and create a fluid experience for them no matter where they're supporting us. So. You know, the the other thing that's going to be important, even if we do have a platform, even if we do have an overarching campaign goal and different sort of sub goals and impacts within that, is the importance of planning ahead. And what I mean by this is that what I see all too often when nonprofits launch a crowdfunding campaign, when they're planning a fundraising event, uh, or, you know, really kind of anything like that is this shock and awe approach, if you will. This idea that, hey, we're announcing our crowdfunding campaign or we're announcing our fundraising gala, right? And all of a sudden there's a huge flurry of activity as you shout, you know, you get up on top of the mountaintops and shout to the world through 
every vehicle possible that this campaign is live. And then people kind of go to sleep and they forget about it. And then, you know, a week or two out when you're kind of nearing the deadline and you're still a ways away from your goal, people start freaking out. And so then they start trying to sprint to the finish. Uh, there's a lot of stress, a lot of running around, working harder, not smarter. Um, and, and, you know, hopefully you still achieve your goals, but even if you do, there's still a lot of undue stress. And so what I would recommend instead <clears throat> is the importance of finding your drumbeat uh, and this notion of really looking for consistency, looking for a more strategic and well thought out plan and timeline for your campaign. And one of the best ways to do this is by actually taking the time, and it doesn't take a lot of time, but really taking the time to map out your content and communication strategy in advance. So instead of just diving in and you know, building the plane while flying it, if you will, the idea is to create what's called an editorial calendar, sometimes also known as a content calendar. And this is also a really powerful tool for another reason, because if you look at the data, the average nonprofit in the U.S. allocates 10 hours a week, one quarter of one full-time person to social media. And that would include, uh, you know, promoting your crowdfunding campaign online. It typically includes email as well. So you've got 10 hours a week, and the problem is, for a lot of reasons, instead of just having one person spend a quarter of his or her time on social media, you are infinitely better off having a team of people, let's say five people, each spending two hours a week. Why? Well, a couple different things to keep in mind. One is sort of the hit by a bus test, right? What if that one person is out sick or gets another job or, you know, who knows? that could create a huge amount of problems for your organization where all of that institutional knowledge exists in only one person. But on the flip side, remember that I said at the very beginning that people don't give to organizations, they give to people. And so maybe Taylor is an expert on our youth services program, but I'm the expert on our homeless initiative. And Kelly is the expert uh, you know, on our senior program. And we really want those different perspectives and styles and voices uh, and areas of expertise to be able to shine through in our social media presence and as we are promoting this crowdfunding campaign. And so that is also another really important um, you know, factor to keep in mind. Now the challenge is, and really part of why this editorial calendar or content calendar is so helpful is Let's say we do have a team of five people that are each going to spend two hours a week so that, you know, many hands make light work. And the final benefit of doing it this way is you're not relying on one person to spend a huge chunk of their time. You're distributing the labor. The Ethiopian proverb is that when a thousand spiders unite, we can tie down a lion, right? So, but the problem is if we've got five people all contributing to our online content and our communication strategy, if it's my turn to tweet or send out a Facebook post, how do I know what Taylor said yesterday or what Kelly's going to say tomorrow without a hugely inefficient process of looking up all the old posts and talking to them about what they plan to post later? Not a good use of anyone's time. So the answer to that question and also uh, simultaneously the answer to how do we create that rolling thunder, that, uh, you know, that approach of finding our drumbeat and building to a crescendo over time is this editorial or content calendar. And quite simply, it's just a very simple tool. You can use literally a paper calendar or a Google Cal or um, you know, anything like that. I prefer spreadsheets. It's just taking a little bit of time, maybe a half an hour to sit down and map out your content strategy for this crowdfunding campaign, for your upcoming event, or for your, your social media posts in general for the coming month. And all we need to know is who is posting what, where, and when. 
So if I know that Taylor is posting to Twitter tomorrow at 3 p.m., and she's going to announce her upcoming fundraising event, and then Kelly is going to put up a blog profiling this year's and you know keynote speaker, and on Friday at 5 p.m., uh, I'm going to send out a Facebook post uh, announcing the crowdfunding campaign. That's about all I need to know in order for me to go off and do my work. Right? And now we can kind of coordinate efforts and work much more efficiently. Again, this doesn't have to be a really complicated tool. This is just a simple screenshot of the kind of editorial calendar I would put together. And I'm happy to email out uh, a free uh, template you know, that looks something like this to anybody who wants it. You've got my Twitter handle on the upper right of the screen now. And at the end of today's presentation, I'll share my personal mobile uh, an email communication and contact info with anybody who wants to reach out. Um, but, you know, something really simple at this level of detail will enable you to coordinate your efforts as it relates to your online communications. Now, as you're mapping out your strategy for the upcoming month or for your campaign leading up to your goal, uh, you know, the crowdfunding deadline coming up in six weeks, as it may be, uh, I, I want to share a few things to keep in mind that will help you optimize your strategy and really get the most engagement possible. Remember, I said earlier, we have entered the attention economy. And the currency in today's economy, the way you know if you're maximizing engagement, are likes, comments, shares, and retweets. So, when should you be posting content on social media in order to get the best response and the highest engagement possible? And when you think about days of the week and times of day, I want to encourage you to follow what I call the burrito principle. And what I mean by that is you basically want to reach people in their downtime. You want to reach people when they're just kind of hanging out, checking their smartphones. And when is that? Uh, well, if we look across all organizations, for and nonprofit, um, globally, what we see is the best times of day and the best days of week to post, well, first of all, in the morning, when, when people are on their way into work, they're on the subway, checking their smartphone on the bus, and, you know, just kind of hanging out. Great time to hit people up. During their lunch break, when they're enjoying a burrito and checking their phone and looking through their Twitter or Facebook feed, hence the name, the burrito principle. Another great time to reach people. On their way back home at the end of the day, or maybe they're still in the office and the boss isn't looking. <clears throat> and finally, the single best time of day to reach people during the week is after the kids go to sleep especially if you're looking for an adult and a professional audience, great time of day to reach folks. And in terms of days of the week, weekdays all tend to perform about the same. Wednesdays are a little worse from the data I've seen, uh, but weekends really outperform the weekdays. So um, something to keep in mind there. Now, two things that I'm going to share. One is it is really critical to note that this is almost the mirror image, almost the exact opposite of your email strategy. Because when you're planning out your emails, uh, you want to look almost at the exact opposite times of day. Why is that the case? Well, with social media, it's the burrito principle. You want to reach people in their downtime. With email, your, your guiding principle is that you never want to be unread message number 38 out of 62. Somebody gets back into the office Monday morning, they've got a whole bunch of clutter in their inbox, delete, 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 right? You are getting no attention uh, and no consideration in that moment. So with email, you want to reach people mid-morning or mid-afternoon, mid-week. So Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, 11 a.m., 2 p.m., if you have a diverse audience that spans the country, 11 a.m. is a great time of day because it's 2 p.m. on the East Coast, um, 11 a.m. Pacific. So, uh, you know, with email, that's the consideration is you want to pop in at the top of their inbox. Totally opposite with social media. 
Now, the other thing I want to mention is that uh, does all of this mean that you can never take a vacation again, that you need to work seven days a week, and that you need to stay awake till 11 p.m. so you can send out that tweet at the optimal moment? And the answer is no, uh, because basically there are these free scheduling tools, uh, and Hootsuite is probably the most popular <laughs> TweetDeck is now owned by Twitter. Facebook offers this functionality directly. Sprout Social is a great platform that does entail a, a small cost but offers uh, additional analytics. And you could write a post today that gets sent out a year from now on Facebook, Twitter, or other platforms through one of these scheduling tools. So they're really powerful. Um, and what they enable you to do is to basically lay down a, a, a you know some cover fire, the evergreen content that you know in advance what you want to say, you know you want to share uh, you know this information about your keynote speaker, or you know you want to you know encourage people, hey, our deadline is only two days away. That kind of content you can write in advance. And of course, you can also still sprinkle in content opportunistically. Some article that speaks to your goal with this crowdfunding campaign just came out today. Great. Add it into the mix and send it out or schedule it for tomorrow, right? But the content you know that's going out there, or if you want to take a night off or a weekend off or a vacation, then these scheduling tools can be really, really powerful. All right. Next. Thing you should be keeping in mind as you're mapping out your content strategy, especially vis-a-vis -vis social media, is, you know, and this is probably the simplest tip that I'm going to share today, but also the most powerful. Uh, quite simply, if your post ends in a question mark instead of a period, you can expect to get twice as many likes, comments, shares, and retweets. Right? And this is pretty straightforward because the bottom line is you should be thinking about social media as nothing more than a digital cocktail party. And if I were to walk up to you at a cocktail party and thrust a newspaper into your hands and say, take a look at what uh, the San Francisco Chronicle had to say about the state of homelessness in the Bay Area, period, you would look and maybe you would say something back to me. But if I did the same thing and I thrust that newspaper into your hands and said, what do you think about what the Chronicle has to say about homelessness in the Bay Area? Question mark. The likelihood of us having a discussion, a dialogue, the likelihood of you responding, right, goes up exponentially because I'm basically asking you to do that. And so the same thing is true with social media. If you ask your community, what do you think about this article, right? Do you agree with our approach? How are you excited to get engaged in this crowdfunding campaign? Then the likelihood of you getting a dialogue going, of getting some really serious engagement, is going to go up by, you know, 100% just by ending your post in a question mark. So let's remember to ask questions wherever possible. All right, the next tip is about the importance of video. And this is really interesting because if you look at your social media content in general, then you should know that a post with a photograph gets on average twice as many likes, comments, and shares as a post that does not include a photograph. Unless we're talking about Twitter, where on average a post with a photograph will get 18 times the amount of retweets and engagement on Twitter. So really, really critical that we leverage photography with our social media. They say a picture is worth a thousand words. But if a picture is worth a thousand words, then a video is worth 2,000 if not 4,000. Because if you look at the numbers around video, in general across social media, a post that includes a video will get four times the engagement as opposed to a post that does not. And if we're talking about a crowdfunding campaign, then 
a po then a campaign that includes a video will raise on average eight times, 800% more than a campaign that does not have a video that relies only on photography or text, right? So huge, huge difference. One minor note that I will add in here is that if you're gonna take the time to post photos or post videos, uh, especially for your crowdfunding campaign, then even though it takes an extra minute, don't be lazy. Make sure you take that extra second and you tag absolutely everyone that is in that photograph, in that video. Why? Well, just think about this from a personal perspective. How many of you are on Facebook? Probably pretty much everybody on this call. Uh, how many of you have ever gotten that email from Facebook saying you've been tagged in a photo or a video? Most of us. Have you ever gotten that email and not immediately gone to Facebook to make sure it's not a really bad picture of you? Probably not. People are vain, right? And the bottom line is once they're at that Facebook page, once they're looking at the video, right, now the likelihood of them liking, commenting, sharing goes up exponentially. And so it's really valuable to make sure that we tag everyone. The other thing that I want to share, especially since, as I just said, your crowdfunding campaign, it is absolutely you know, mandatory that you have a video associated with it because you're going to raise eight times the amount of money just simply by having a video. But the point I want to share here is that you should not be scared. That does not mean that you need to go out and hire Steven Spielberg and secure a seven or an eight figure advertising budget to put together a feature length movie. No, you can use materials you already have and create a one to two minute piece that doesn't need a big budget. It doesn't need to be professionally edited. The only thing it does need to do is it needs to be authentic and it needs to really showcase the impact that you are planning to make in a very personal way. Ideally, you're getting out of your own way and you are letting the people who you're going to help uh, tell the story for them. And so I want to share a short video. This was produced by a 13-year-old girl. It's about a disease I've never heard of. And she was able to raise $30,000 in two weeks with this video. And so let's get this teed up. Hold on one sec. All right. So this is Sarah, and this is her R&D awareness video. Let's check it out.
I love that piece. Uh, and it's really, really powerful. Uh, but like I said, it's authentic. It's, you know, that is a person who's suffering from the disease talking about the impact that your support can make on her life and on the lives of other children like her, right? And what do you suppose her budget for that piece was? You know, maybe a couple dollars? The cost of buying some, uh, you know, flashcards and some markers? She used her home computer. There was no editing, right? So it doesn't need to be a big budget piece. It should, in fact, be short. Two minutes is like on the high end of how long you want this piece to be. So really, you know, looking at the 90 second, 60 second range, keep it short, keep it sweet, keep it authentic. Uh, and if she could raise $30,000 in two weeks for a disease that I've never heard of, and I've shown this video all around the world, I've literally only met one person ever who's heard of this disease, what can your cause do? What can your cause do with the resources that you have available to you? Really, really powerful opportunity of video to share your story. So let's look at that in the context of our next step, which is just simply uploading content to Kimbia or whatever other platform you're using for your crowdfunding campaign. So we definitely want to have a video. Uh, if you're including photos as well, make sure you ABC, always be cropping and zoom in on those faces. Really helpful. Um, we want minimal text. That is not what's going to drive people to action, but certainly you can share your story um, and reiterate some of the points from the video. And really, you know, focus in on the personal stories uh, that uh, are what move people to action, right? Uh, and so that, you know, I also just want to quickly mention that, uh, as I said in the beginning when I was introducing myself, these are not just ideas that I've heard or that I'm espousing and lecturing about. These are ideas I've personally put into practice. And we had a small $500 budget to put together a film for a crowdfunding campaign I recently did. Uh, to bring clean drinking water to a farming community in Madagascar through NUMI Foundation. Uh, and we were able to raise over $80,000 uh, in about one month. So that was a really successful campaign for us. We're right about to launch another one for India, the largest organic tea farm in all of India. Um, and, uh, you know, there's no question about it that we're going to be producing a video as part of that campaign. Absolutely correct. All right, the next step is about the critical importance of seeding the tip jar. And this is really rooted in a psychology study, an experiment that I heard about that was so fascinating when it was, you know, as it relates to donor behavior. And the idea uh, of why you need to seed the tip jar and why you will never go to a Starbucks and see an empty tip jar is because uh, this experiment, there was an art museum in the Midwest in Minnesota, and they had one of those lucite cubes that the researchers put out to, you know, encourage people to donate and see how much they donated. And at first, the cube was empty, and nobody gave. They just kept walking by. Then they put some change in the cube, and people gave change. They put some singles in the cube, and people gave singles. They put some, dollars, some $5 bills in there, and they gave fives. Um, and then they put 20s in there, and people just kept walking. Okay? So the idea is there was kind of a bell curve. And once there was, uh, you know, if there was nothing in the cube, then people gave nothing. If there was something in the cube within reason, within the comfort zone of the donors, then they would follow suit. But if the amount in there got too high, people kept walking. The same is true for that barista at Starbucks. And the same is true for your crowdfunding campaign, right? And so instead of, uh, you know, launching your campaign once you've done all the other steps that I've outlined, if you launch your campaign to the public and you have an empty thermometer, then just like that empty cube, no one's going to give, right? So ideally, we want to have that thermometer at least 20 to 30% of the way to our goal before we publish this, this campaign to the public. Now, how do we get that initial 20 or 30%? We reach out to our key existing donors, to our board, to our staff, and we invite them to basically take a seat 
at the table of honor. And ideally, we do this in such a way that they are grateful to be asked. We tell them that as one of the core supporters of the organization today, you really owe a lot of the impact you've been able to have and the traction that you've made to their support. And you are entering this exciting new stage of your development. You're about to launch one of your first crowdfunding campaigns. And one of the things that you heard from this uh, you know, author guy who led a webinar recently is the importance of seeding the tip jars, the importance of getting uh, you know, some traction with your thermometer before you present it to the public. So would they be interested in joining the inner circle of supporters for this campaign to help you reach that 20 or 30% goal before you announce it to the public? Well, gosh, yeah, thanks for asking, right? That is a position of honor that you are inviting them to take. And if done right, that can actually make them feel good about being asked to support this campaign at such a critical ground level. So seed the tip jar uh, and really, really remember to try to get to at least 20 to 30% of your goal before you start announcing it to the public. Now, next tip as we get ready to wind down in the next 15 minutes here, and we're at eight, step eight of 10, um, is the importance of making your online donate button shine. Now, bear in mind that if you're doing a crowdfunding campaign, it is likely to lead to more traffic to your website. Some people that are considering giving are going to take a look at your site, and maybe they'll give through the crowdfunding page, maybe they'll give through your website, but on average, 0.8% of visitors to a nonprofit website will become donors. We want you to get that number up to 1%, maybe even 2% of your traffic should be donating. So what I want to encourage you to do now is a three-part experiment. And the first part of this experiment, and, and by the way, if you do all three parts of this experiment, which should take you no more than two to three months, I will promise you that you will at least double your online fundraising results, not only for your crowdfunding campaign, but permanently moving forward. The high tide will raise your boat and you will be raising more than double the amount of money through your website moving forward. And just so you know, I've promised this to thousands of nonprofits all over the world. I've yet to meet a single nonprofit that has failed to at least double their online fundraising results when doing this three-part experiment. So let's get into it. The first step is going to be to optimize your donate button. And this tip actually came to me through my friends at Net Network for Good. And if you haven't heard of them, they have raised over a billion dollars through the Internet for nonprofits. Right? They're kind of like a huge mall that connects donors, uh, millions of donors, to pretty much every cause that's out there. So they have huge volume and they're able to learn uh, lessons very powerfully as a result. Well, they ran, when I interviewed them for the online fundraising chapter of my new book, um, they talked about this experiment that they ran where they turned their donate button from gray to red and boom, in an instant, they got 30% more online donations, 30% just from going gray to red. And the point here is not that you should change your donate button to red, but the point here is that you should experiment with your donate button. And maybe red is your color, maybe it's green or purple, maybe it should be a circle or a square or a triangle, or maybe if you're focused on uh, you know, preserving the, the wild bobcat, the Appalachian bobcat, Maybe your donate button should look like a paw print from that bobcat. I don't know, but the idea is the right answer is probably not obvious to you, but because we're talking about online donation, because you're dealing with a technology-based approach to fundraising, you have access to data. And so the idea for all three of these experiments I'm gonna talk about is instead of embracing your gut or your intuition, embrace the data and use it to optimize against one and only one metric for success. And for this first experiment, the only metric that we're gonna optimize against is what percentage of people that come to our website are clicking the donate button. 
what percent of people click donate, right? And again, ideally, it should be a little bit over 1%, maybe even 2%, because on average, 0.8% of people to a nonprofit site will donate. So the idea here is we're going to run an A-B split. So currently, using a free tool like Google Analytics or something like Web Trends, you should be able to pretty easily figure out what percentage of traffic to your website is clicking donate. And then, as part of this experiment, you're going to play around and you're going to change your donate button from gray to red for three days and then to green for another three days and then to purple and then try out the square or the rectangle, change the font, etc. And basically, you're going to dial in the optimal donate button, the right color, the right shape, the right font. Okay, and you're not dialing it in based on what you think looks the best or stands out. You're dialing it in based on the data. Again, only one metric, what percentage of people are clicking donate, and the solution, the combination of font and shape and color that gets the most amount of people to click, that's the donate button that you want. And hopefully that alone, just like Network for Good, is going to get you 30% more online donations. Now, the second part of this experiment that you're going to want to do is, if you remember back when we talked about thinking incrementally and the different default donation levels for your crowdfunding campaign or for just your online fundraising efforts in general, right? should it be 50, 100, 250, 500 other? Or should it be 100, 250, 500, 1,000 other? Or should it be 5, 25, 50, 100 other? Right? I don't know, but again, the right answer is probably not the one you would guess, and it is worth experimenting with. The only metric, the only variable that you're going to optimize against for this second experiment is average online donation. And across all nonprofits in the U.S., the average one-time online donation is $82, right? And the other thing that is true for the majority of nonprofits in this country is that <clears throat> usually, excuse me, usually the most common donation level will be the one second from the bottom, right? In the case of the example we saw before where it was 50, 100, 250, 500 other, it would be not 50, but 100. Why? Because psychologically speaking, people don't like to feel cheap they usually will skip over the lowest level and do the second lowest level. So that second lowest level is the critical level you want to dial in. And if you're able to use a tool like Kimbia to identify what your current average online gift is, let's say it's 82 bucks, which is the, the average across the industry, you want to bump that number up by 20 or 25%, so to about 100 um, and make that your second lowest level. So as a starting point for most nonprofits, 50, 100, 250, 500 other is a great starting point. But then you want to experiment, and you want to keep an eye at each different combination of amounts on your average online gift, and maybe you surprise yourself, and maybe 5, 25, 50, 100 other is for whatever reason the, the combination of amounts, the gift string, as it's known, that optimizes your average online gift. Really important. And then finally, the third and final piece of this experiment is the default types of impact that are associated with each of these donation levels. So for 50 bucks, we can provide 10 textbooks to children. For $100, we help a kid go to college. Whatever that might be, Right, And the idea here is now that we've dialed in our donate button and the default donation levels, we want to have a, a brainstorm with our organization, and we want to identify three or four different things that we can do at each level of impact. And if you're not the kind of organization where this is a really simple process and you're providing clean drinking water to people at a very clear cost or meals or whatever the case may be, right? then one thing you can think of is, you know, looking at this as staff time. So with $100, 
uh, we are able to provide 10 hours of staff time, and that means, uh, you know, seven youth that we can mentor and one child that we can help get into college. Whatever it might be for you, the idea is you want to come up with three or four different examples of the kind of impact that you can unlock at each of these donation levels and try out those different defaults, uh, you know, try out those different types of impact at each default donation level and see, once again, we're optimizing against the same metric in the second and the third experiment, what maximizes or optimizes your average online gift. And based on the data, whichever combination does that, that's the impact associated with each of the, the default donation levels. So now we've dialed in our donate button, the gift or donation string, those different default donation levels, and the impact associated with each. And again, I promise you that if you take the time, usually two or three months to do this, um, you will at least double your online fundraising results. So now we've got our online fundraising infrastructure really optimized. And now as we, uh, you know, kind of have our house in order uh, and we're ready for the, the hopeful flood of traffic that we're going to get to our site as we start promoting this campaign, pretty much one of the final steps is to actually promote the campaign. And the thing to remember here is, you know, two things. One, remember that rolling thunder. Remember that notion that we want to find our drumbeat and, you know, build it over time. We don't want to, uh, you know, blow it out in the beginning, fall asleep, and then get all excited at the end. No, uh, we want to avoid that stress. We want a graceful, uh, you know, gradual campaign that builds upon itself and one that harnesses all media, social media, direct mail, PR, your website, your blog. Make sure you integrate email into this campaign. That is the biggest driver of online fundraising results is email. We talked about the times of day and days of week you should be sending out your emails and your social media. So let's keep all of these in mind. And also, uh, the final tip is to remember that we have to celebrate our successes. That means when we reach 25% or 50% or 80% of our goal, you want to use that as an opportunity to tell your community, hey, we're making progress. Hey, we're at 80%. We're almost there. With your support, we will reach 100% of our goal, and we will build that playground for those 647 children. You want to keep people posted. You also want to thank your donors. One of the things that nonprofits don't recognize that's something we talk about a lot in the business world where they always say it's seven times more expensive to acquire a new customer as to maintain an existing one. Well, for nonprofits, it's actually 11 times as expensive to acquire a new donor as to maintain an existing one. So we need to communicate ideally at least seven times between asks. That's not to say there's not going to be a donate button on your newsletter, for example, but it's just not the focal point of that communication. And one of the things that is the best piece of communication you should absolutely be sending out to all of your donors is right after they contribute, you should be using that opportunity to say thank you in a very simple way and a video that showcases the kind of impact and the people that you're helping uh, is a really powerful way to do that. This is just a short 30 second video um, that does a great job of doing that and again is done on a budget. Let's check it. <laughs> So again, super simple, not a big budget, getting out of your own way and showcasing the people that you're helping. A couple of resources that might be helpful moving forward. Facebook has a great Facebook for nonprofits page where they talk about different best practices and case studies. Google for nonprofits is more of a discount shopping mall where they talk about some of the tools they make available for free or at a big discount to nonprofits. Most importantly, Google Grants, where any nonprofit can sign up for $10,000 a month of free advertising on Google. 
Nonprofit Tech for Good has a great newsletter and website talking about social media and mobile. My friends at Network for Good have fundraising one, two, three, where they talk about uh, social media and mobile, as does Best Cancer, who's written several amazing books. Great newsletter, great website. Social Bright is focused on social media for nonprofits. TechSoup, the world's largest provider of technology to nonprofits. Also a lot of discounted software and hardware there. Uh, and the Nonprofit Technology Network, where you can interact with a global uh, community of decision makers and check out their nonprofit technology conference. So with that, I really just want to thank everybody for your time and your attention today. I hope you found the program helpful and that you're leaving not only inspired, but inspired to action. This is my personal email and mobile phone if I can ever be helpful. Like I said, the work I do in the world is helping people help. Uh, I do a lot of pro bono stuff, so you can feel free to reach out to me if you want a free copy of that editorial calendar template. Uh, or if you have specific questions or want to connect via LinkedIn so I can connect you with other funders, please feel free to reach out directly uh, uh, and consider me at your disposal. And as I wrap up and hand things back to Kimby here, I really just want to thank each and every one of you for your time and attention today. And I want to thank you not only on behalf of myself and not only on behalf of our host at Kimbia, but I want to thank you on behalf of the thousands, if not millions of people that you collectively serve. It's really been an honor. And I thank you for your great work in the community. Awesome. Thank you so much, Darian. And thanks, everyone, for joining us. Um, I had a couple of questions in the chat box that I've kind of been answering as we've been going along. And one question I ended up putting into the chat box for everyone to see was about donate buttons. There is a tool that I love to use called Canva. You go to canva.com, and it's amazing for creating all sorts of graphics. I think there's probably a way to create a nice-looking button in there. Um, also, I would check on some of the stock photography websites and see if you can find any donate icons or anything like that. Um, so without any further ado, if anybody has any questions uh, for me, you can reach out to me at taylor at kimbia.com and we will be sending out the recording and the slides. Uh, really appreciate your time. If you want to learn more about Kimbia and working with us to help you do crowdfunding and any other type of online fundraising campaign you may be thinking about doing, we would love to talk to you. Um, so yeah, just shoot me an email, taylor at kimbia.com. And um, thank you so much again, Darian. It's always a pleasure. Uh, always really, really good stuff that you share. We will be pulling five lucky winners out of a hat. And uh, if you win one of the copies of Darian's book, I will uh, be sending you a personal email to let you know. All right. So thank you very much. And that wraps it up for today. Have a great afternoon, everyone. Bye-bye.